Welcome back to Inventive Problem Solving and Biomedical Engineering. This is the second lesson on trees, subtitled Invention on Demand. Today's topic is one of the most foundational, fundamental, and powerful concepts of all of trees, known as contradictions. Rather than give you a formal definition right now, let's start with an illustration, hopefully one that you'll remember. This is a Chinese finger trap, also known as a Chinese finger handcuff. You've probably seen it, and the situation and contradiction are kind of obvious. You want to get unstuck from this finger trap. Naturally, the inclination is to pull your fingers apart. If this was not a Chinese finger trap, that would solve the problem. You would slide your fingers out, and that would be a good thing, and all would be well with the world. But because of the construction of this uh, braid, the harder you pull, the tighter it gets. And that's a bad thing. So this action of pulling yields both a good thing and a bad thing that kind of cancel one another out. And now we have a situation that is a contradiction. While I was looking for photographs of this finger trap, I ran across this actual review from an actual Amazon customer who had bought one of these for his daughter's birthday. Rather than read it to you, I'll let you read it on your own. You can right click on the slide to pause it. And we will talk about a solution later in the presentation. Here's another situation you might be familiar with. It's a common problem of having to thread a wire, like let's say an ethernet cable through a wall or through the ceiling. What's commonly done is something called a fish tape, a semi-rigid wire is threaded backwards through the passageway in the ceiling or the wall and then connected to the cable. This is typically done with some electrical tape and you have to wrap it several times so that the two don't come apart in the middle of the wall. A problem arises because that blob of tape is now larger than the wire and therefore it cannot fit through the hole drilled in the wall. So the obvious solution is just drill a bigger hole. But this is undesirable for two reasons. First of all, you need to unthread the fish tape to drill the hole and start all over again. And secondly, now you have a bigger hole that needs to be patched. So we have a kind of contradiction. The wire needs to be thin to fit through the hole, and yet it needs to be large because of the presence of this interconnection, this tape, that has to hold the two cables together. What would you do in this situation? Let's come back to that later, but let's look at this in a little more technical detail in terms of what we have here is known as an inventive problem. That's because it fulfills these two conditions. First, it involves one or more contradictions. And secondly, there is no known way or means of solution or no obvious solution. So in terms of ideality, we have useful functions or effects in the system and harmful effects. A contradiction occurs when in order to improve the useful function, in this case, getting the wire through the hole, it creates an unwanted or harmful effect, making the hole larger. Or alternatively, a situation in which the useful functions or effects is diminished and the harmful effects remains the same. Or thirdly, a situation in which harmful effects emerge, which is not compensated by any counteracting useful function or effects. So we recognize, of course, the ratio of useful functions or effects to harmful functions or effects is what we call ideality. And inventive problem solving is defined as a procedure in which we improve ideality either by improving the useful functions, diminishing the harmful functions, or both. This is contrasted with a trade-off. This is a common solution to a problem, but not an inventive solution or activity. For example, in this case, making a bigger hole, or let's say compromising the strength to achieve an acceptable weight, or reducing horsepower to conserve fuel. In the trade-off, we may improve useful functions, but we pay a price in terms of harmful effects. Or we may decrease useful functions, 
on the account of reducing or eliminating the harmful effects. So here's an example. Here's a design challenge. Let's say we have a bridge built out of I-beams and we want to increase the load capacity of the bridge. Well, the trade-off is simply use a larger beam. That would increase the load capacity, problem solved. But it's not an inventive activity. I can't write a patent for it because it's obvious. We pay a price. Increasing the size of the beam increases the weight of the beam. And the larger the weight of the beam, the less the load capacity. So it's actually a vicious cycle. Let's illustrate this on an XY plot, where the y-axis is ideality and the x-axis is the size. So we know that making it larger will increase the strength. That's a good thing. But also increasing the size will make it heavier or decrease the lightness and hence decrease the ideality. It also will increase the cost, which is not a good thing. So this is a trade-off. An inventive solution is something in which we could reduce the weight and yet preserve the strength or make the strength greater. And in this case, we've altered the topology completely. We've abandoned the I-beam and we've adopted something of a truss. And this is a potential invention. This is patentable. And we see it all around us. It's not a coincidence that we see trusses instead of gigantic I-beams in all of our bridges around Pittsburgh. Let's return to a couple of previous examples just for point of reference. Remember the inductive stovetop that I like so much. The contradiction here is on the one hand I want something hot to heat my water and make it boil, but on the other hand heat increases the risk of burning my hand, so I want it to be cold for that reason. Another example, the family needs lots of water to cook, clean, etc. But the more water means more weight. And more weight means neck, back, pain, injury, requiring, let's say, multiple people or making multiple trips. So that is a trade-off and requires an inventive solution. Let's return to our wiring problem. Were you able to come up with an inventive solution? Something that is large, that provides the gripping strength of the electrical tape, but yet small, that goes through the hole in the wall. Do you remember this thing? This is actually an enabling technology. You see what it does? You see how it could potentially be used to link the cable and the fish tape without adding to the diameter? Well, sure enough, this is an actual thing, a Chinese finger trap based wire puller or cable puller. It's actually an invention. It's patented and it's a product. Contradiction solved. And by the way, this same technology is not just used around the house. It's used in all manner of construction. It's actually a very brilliant and very useful technology. While we're on the topic of wire routing, I want to share a couple of other inventions that I found in my travels. If you've ever done this before, or maybe just use your imagination, when you're trying to fish a wire through a wall, it doesn't always go where you think it's going to go. There's no real way to steer an unsteerable, flexible wire. So this invention kind of speaks for itself. It involves putting a magnetic target, or bob, at the end of the wire, and then steering it with a magnetic field. You may recognize this principle of introducing a field that interacts with a substance that solves the problem. We'll be looking at field substance theory again in a later class. Here's another clever invention. It's a drill that's used for passing wires through cinder block. So in this particular case, the drill has a hole in the end or an eyelet that accepts the wire that you're trying to fish through the hole and serves a dual function of actually being the, both the drill and that fish tape that we saw earlier. Very clever combination of functions that solves a contradiction and yet another invention. 
So please remember this. An inventive solution to a problem has two requirements. One, improving part or characteristic of a system without two, impairing the other parts or characteristics of the system or adjacent systems. In other words, inventive solutions to problems involves resolution or removal of contradictions. Words to live by. Here's a mundane but illustrative example. Let's take this sheet of paper. It has several useful functions. It's a low cost means of communication, writing down your ideas. It's lightweight, it's flexible, comes in many colors. I'm sure you could add to the list. You could make a paper airplane, yada yada. What harm could possibly come of a piece of paper? Well, it does take up a lot of space. It's costly to store and to ship. It creates tons of waste, it kills trees. It's not impervious to the elements. It gets moldy, it dries out, it tears easily, it gives you paper cuts. I'm sure you can come up with a longer list, I'm sure. So that would imply that there might be an opportunity for an invention because ideality is not optimal. Yet the paper has existed in this form since the beginning of written history, no pun intended. And it hasn't changed very much in all that time, not likely to in the near future. So is there really an invention opportunity here? Well, if you said yes, you would probably be right. So let's look at the Kindle. It was the number one Christmas gift of 2009. Don't quote me, but you can Google it. It was a product that was waiting to happen. The technology kind of existed. It was just a matter of time for someone to come along, take the leap of faith, recognizing there was a demand for a better alternative to a paper book. And they were absolutely right. They came out with the Kindle, and then an avalanche of competitors came out trying to play catch up. So there you have it. Now let's look at so let's look at the ideality for a minute of the Kindle. It's obviously not perfect. It takes power. It's rather expensive as compared to a piece of paper. And you can't really jot down your ideas on a Kindle. So there may actually be another opportunity for innovation in the realm of paper. So along comes this invention, which I happen to note it which I think is a really elegant and clever invention. And it's getting a lot of traction. They're selling a lot of these. It's called the Boogie Board. And it's nothing but a liquid crystal writing pad. You jot your ideas on it, you hit a button, and it erases, and you start over again. I think this is illustrative that after thousands and thousands of years of evolution of technology that has been with us forever, that there is still room for improvement if we just study and analyze the ideality and hence the contradictions. Solving contradictions is what leads to brilliant, profitable, and worthwhile innovations. And by the way, in this case, what is the enabling technology that allowed this to happen? I'll let you investigate that on your own. Now let's return to the theory of inventive problem solving. Altschiller recognized two major categories or types of contradictions. He calls them a technical contradiction and a physical contradiction. And we're going to focus mostly on the technicals this week and move on to the physical contradiction next week. He says that technical systems are similar to living organisms. They consist of interrelated parts. Changing one part of the system may have a negative effect on another part of the system, as we've seen already. Technical contradiction is defined as a situation in which, as one characteristic of a system improves, another must degrade. Just as an example, as you depress the accelerator of your car, you go faster, but you consume more fuel. There's a price to pay. As we reduce the weight of a structural component, we lose strength. As you take more cough medicine, you get more sleepy. And we're going to see many, many more in the subsequent weeks. But I think you get the idea. So keep on the lookout for buried contradictions. Like in conversation, we wish to implant an artificial hip that doesn't loosen over time. 
This can be rewritten in a syntax of a contradiction. Hip implant provides mobility, but hip implant has a limited lifespan. We're developing a new beta blocker without side effects. In other words, beta blocker provides useful function, lowering blood pressure, but causes hazardous function, dizziness. Also, keep on the lookout for subtle contradictions, particularly the words yes, but. That's a good idea, but it'll never work. It'll cost too much. It defies the laws of physics. These are opportunities for invention because you have buried in those statements the idea of useful functions, harmful functions at odds with one another. The other kind of contradiction is known as a physical contradiction. This is a situation in which a characteristic of a system must exist in two states or something must be both absent and present at the same time. For example, suture, it's needed to be present to do its function, to close a wound, but its very presence interferes with normal growth of tissue, so it needs to be absent. Using my favorite example, stove must be hot to cook food, but stove must be cold to prevent burns. Third example, a bar of soap needs to be slippery to clean properly, but the soap must be non-slippery to hold in the hand. Opportunity for invention. If possible, if we can convert technical contradictions to physical contradictions, it opens up a new toolbox of opportunities. We'll get to that in a future class. Up until now, we have articulated our contradictions in prose using words or sentences. We also have a very powerful tool known as the contradiction diagram, which I'm going to illustrate now. It's also known as the function link function diagram. It's a tool for identifying and defining contradictions buried in a problem, and hence a tool for finding solutions. It's comprised of two basic elements, useful effects and harmful effects, and two connectors, produces or counteracts. For example, cough medicine, a good thing, produces drowsiness, a bad thing, and hence a contradiction. Drowsiness, bad thing, counteracts ability to get work done, a good thing. Here are common types of contradictions. A thing or an action, whether it be a useful thing, an action, or a harmful one, if it produces a good thing, a useful effect, and yet produces a harmful effect, well, there is a contradiction. If that thing or action counteracts a harmful effect, well, overall, that's a good thing, but if it counteracts the useful effect, that means we're paying a price and that's a bad thing, and hence there is a contradiction. When we don't have the benefit of color graphics or fancy software, we can write contradictions using these three shapes. A thing or action, which is neither good nor bad, we use a triangle. Bad things we put in circles, and good things we put in boxes. Okay, here's a more detailed example of a contradiction. The problem is employees working in a high-rise building complain that the building's elevators are too slow. People get bored waiting for the elevators, which makes numerous stops to pick up people from other floors. The management must consider various options to resolve the problem. So buried in that prose are contradictions. There's good things, bad things acting on one another. Okay, let's try turning this into a diagram. Let's look for noun-verb phrases. So first of all, employees are complaining. That's a bad thing. And that's kind of the end result of the problem. So let's put that on the right side of the diagram. They're complaining because they're getting bored. They're getting bored because the elevators are too slow and they have to wait. They're slow partly because they're making many stops. But that's a good thing 
because that allows them to pick up people from any floors, which is another good thing. We can also assume that the elevators are slow because they're outdated. Now, picking up people from any floors, as I said, is a good thing, and that leads to satisfaction. But the employees complaining is the opposite of satisfaction. And if we think of the objective function of this system as satisfied people, we can see the conflicting elements of the system. Can you now pick out the contradictions? Remember, they are good things that cause both good and bad things, or bad things that counteract good things? Well, there's one. The many stops is doing a good thing, picking up people from any floors, but slowing down the whole system. So just looking at the diagram in and of itself yields ideas for solving the problem. So if we can interrupt this chain of events, employees getting bored, which leads to complaining, we can partially solve the problem. So here's an example if we simply entertain the employees while they're waiting. You could have a TV screen or have any number of things to amuse them as they're waiting. That would make a huge difference in their feeling bored. Of course, we can update the elevators to faster elevators and also solve the problem, although in a more expensive way, but possibly, in this particular case, the only way. Find a different way to pick up many people from many floors that doesn't require as many stops. Now, there's an interesting concept, because that could technically be uh, an actionable logistical solution as opposed to an expensive technological solution. Without the benefit of a diagram, we can also map out a virtual diagram in words. People get bored is produced by people have to wait. People have to wait is produced by elevators are slow, etc., etc. This is another form of contradiction diagram that's a little less graphical. Okay, at this point we've defined the problem relatively well. Let's try to begin to solve the problem. It helps to dig a little bit deeper into the background and the technology to educate ourselves about the underlying physics and history of the problem. So it so happens that from the 1940s to today, elevator call systems have operated on a single uniform principle, the up and down hall push button. And the logic goes like this. A car will continue traveling in the current direction as long as the remaining requests in that direction. If there are no requests in that direction, the car should wait in idle. The car should change direction if there are requests in the opposite direction. So this works in simple systems where, let's say, there's one elevator. But when there are many elevators with many floors, with many people, it's not necessarily the most efficient algorithm. So now with that knowledge, we can begin to look for an algorithmic solution to the problem. We're going to apply a principle of trees, which you have yet to learn. It's called segmentation, but I'll give you a preview. It says that you should divide an object into independent parts, or make an object sectional, or increase the degree of an object's segmentation. I'm sure you've seen this if you've ever been to a high-rise building like the Empire State Building. The many, many elevators are broken down into banks. There may be even and odd elevators. There might be the high floors and the low floors, or there might be floors uh, 1 through 10 and 10 through 20 and so forth. And in so doing, it makes it much more efficient to get from the ground floor to, let's say, the 82nd floor. And that in and of itself is a very simple solution that has been implemented long ago and which is uh, a clever uh, implementation of a tree's principle. While on a business trip, I know this is very clever elevator that made me think of trees, and particularly invented principle number 10, prior action, also known as preliminary action. It says that you should carry out a required action in advance, in full or at least in part. So you see what's happening here is rather than getting on the elevator and selecting your floor, in this elevator, you select your floor in advance 
so that the computer that's running the elevators can define the optimal direction to which to dispatch and clump the individual calls for uh, elevator floors. I did a little digging and learned that this technology is called destination-based systems. And it was made possible because in the 1980s, microprocessors began to be introduced into the elevator systems. And having a microprocessor, now you could introduce heuristics or experience-based problem solving, which attempts to approximate reasonable, if not optimal, solutions to handling requests, as if there was a human dispatcher making logical decisions. These more recent algorithms are typically applied to elevator banks through a lift group control system, as it's called, using the logic to send off the most appropriate car among the group to answer a given request. So you see buried in here, there's an enabling technology. The fact that microprocessors are available replaces the old-fashioned system of relays and switches and allows us to introduce more advanced logic and optimization and numerics into this otherwise antiquated system. You see any other keywords? Bonus points for problem solving. While researching the topic of elevators, I was amused by the number of trees principles that I ran into. If you think about this problem, to create an elevator that has a greater capacity, that can carry more people, that's going to involve more weight and hence more force, which is going to require a larger, more powerful motor. And motors become exponentially more expensive as they get bigger. So there's an upper limit and hence there's a contradiction. The solution, whether you realize it or not, is the use of a counterweight. Every elevator has some kind of large weight that's somewhat equal and opposite to the average weight of the elevator so as to make the, the net force required by the motor uh, basically zero or closer to zero. The TRIZ principle is known as counterweight and it says compensate for the object's weight by joining with another object that has a lifting force or B compensate for the weight of an object by interaction with an environment providing an aerodynamic or hydrodynamic force which gives me an idea but I'll leave that for another day. Okay one last elevator reference I promise. I also ran into this interesting innovation as researching elevators. Here's an example in which the elevator going up requires electrical power but on the way down has the potential of actually generating power. So if we were to break this down in the spirit of inventive problem solving, we would recognize that there is a resource. And the resource is the potential energy caused by gravity of lifting that weight up into the air. And it allows us to use a trees principle, inventive principle number 25, called self-service also known as use the culprit. Make an object service itself and carry out supplementary repair operations or, in this case, make use out of waste of material and energy. Here's a medical example that illustrates contradiction diagrams. It's an actual problem that I was involved with as a consultant for a local company known as Renal Solutions. It goes like this. Nocturnal dialysis involves circulating a patient's blood outside the body through some sort of filter. You can see in the diagram, there's a catheter that sucks blood out, goes through a pump, through the dialyzer, and then back into the patient. Now, unfortunately, if that venous catheter gets pulled out, the patient's blood will get sucked out and dumped on the floor, and the patient will die. So there is a definite hazard that needs to be addressed and also an opportunity for invention. So if we were to draw an influence diagram, just to help break down that problem into its component parts, we'll start with the system itself. Needle is inserted into a blood vessel. It penetrates the vessel and it accesses the blood supply. That's a good thing. It transfers blood to a catheter which then transports the blood from the patient to the dialyzer. That's a good thing. 
The dialyzer removes waste. That's a good thing. Okay, there's also another catheter which returns blood from the dialyzer to the patient. And that is connected to the dialyzer, which removes the waste. So these are all good things. This is how the system normally functions. There's a pump, of course, that makes this all possible. So the pump is creating a pressure rise through the tubing to force blood through that pressure drop of the dialyzer and, and tubing. So here's the problem. We don't want patients to bleed to death. That's a bad thing. Let's try to study this backwards and see if we can break it down to its component parts. Patient's going to bleed to death if the catheter is pulled out of the body, if the connectors become disconnected. Connectors might become disconnected if a patient rolls over in bed. That might happen if a patient's uncomfortable. So looking at this diagram, we might begin to see opportunities for innovation, either maybe in the discomfort and the patient's ability to roll over in bed, or something to do with the catheters being vulnerable to being pulled out and causing a bleeding to death. Or maybe something to do with the pump that's providing the pressure that is causing uh, the blood to be sucked out of the patient. Here's the beginning of a solution to the problem. What if we had one catheter instead of two, so that blood is pumped out and back through the same catheter, so that if the catheter is pulled out, both the inflow and the outflow are pulled out together? This is actually using a design principle known as self-service. So the action of pulling out the catheter, which is the, the culprit, is actually part of the solution. It simultaneously pulls out the blood supply and hence prevents the draining of blood. But there's a contradiction, obviously, because where does the blood go when it's being pumped out? It can't be pumped out and pumped in at the same time, right? The flow must flow out of the catheter, but it also must flow into the catheter. That's actually a physical contradiction. You remember something that needs to be present and absent at the same time. So that's solved by having two pumps. One pump sucks blood out of the body into a reservoir, then a valve is switched, and then that blood gets pumped back into the patient through pump number two. And then the switch switches again, and the cycle repeats itself. So it's a two-step process. But now we have a new problem, because now we have two pumps. We've added a reservoir to the system, and we have doubled the time of treatment because blood is being withdrawn from the patient only half of the time. So it's an example of solve one problem, create a new problem. So what if we replace those roller pumps, those old-fashioned pumps, with a, with a bellows pump, having the capacity to hold blood? What we're basically doing is we're combining the function of the reservoir and the pump into one thing, and thereby consolidating components. So that's rather clever, but it still yields the problem of doubling the duration of the treatment. Here's half of a solution to the pumping cycle problem. If we have two pumps that are alternating, one's filling while the other one is emptying, that will at least provide the opportunity to maintain a constant flow. But yet we still have the problem of withdrawing and replacing blood through the same catheter. This is actually the basis of a system for renal solutions known as the Alliant pumping system. And you see it's rather complicated. And there's the CEO of the company standing proudly by his machine. So what do you think is the solution to this problem? We still have the problem. How do we simultaneously withdraw and infuse blood from the same tube? Well, the answer so the solution to this contradiction of pumping fluid in and out of the same tube at the same time is to use a double lumen catheter. So it's basically two tubes built into one. In this case, having two side holes that allows you to withdraw blood upstream and discharge it downstream through the same blood vessel. It uses a trees principle, which you'll learn soon, called separation in space. And it's such a great 
idea that it received the U.S. patent from the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, and it is a very lucrative product for this company, Angiodynamic. Contradiction solved. And it's actually a problem that's been solved many times over. If you do a Google search on double lumen catheters, you'll see numerous patents in the patent literature, which leads to an important lesson that it pays to be familiar and aware of prior solutions to similar problems. Now, of course, you can't cram all of this information into your head all at once. There's just too much information. And that's part of what the TREES principles will do for you. It'll help to consolidate all that has ever been done and all solutions to all problems into a set of manageable rules and tricks and principles and heuristics. Okay, one more problem. This has to do with the technology of stem cell therapy for advanced heart failure. Stem cells are cells that, as you know, can differentiate into any kind of cell. So it's an exciting technology for restoring function of a diseased or infarcted uh, heart muscle. The problem statement goes, stem cell implantation offers promise for restoring cardiac function of diseased heart. However, only a small fraction of the cells, less than 5%, survive after the implantation with conventional techniques. In other words, it was hoped that you could take some stem cells, let's say from the bone marrow, inject them into this dead tissue, and have them thrive and grow and join hands and, and proliferate. But of course, that tissue died for a reason. It died because the blood vessels were blocked going to that part of the, of the muscle. So why would you ever expect new cells to do any better than the old cells? So in writing the contradiction diagram, one method that I use from time to time is I just kind of scatter different concepts and elements of the system. Remember, I have nouns and verbs in the problem statement. So here they are kind of scattered um, on the paper. Now let's try to connect them. I know that perfusion, for example, promotes healthy myocytes. So that's a good thing that results in a good thing. And I can continue to connect the various components of the system. I'll let you study it on your own rather than me dictate it to you. Looking at the contradictions, remember these are good things that cause bad things and bad things that interfere with good things, we can start to see opportunities for solving the problem. For example, we see that chemical signaling is a good thing. It promotes differentiation and integration of the cells. So if we can find a different way of providing that signaling that doesn't require stem cells, because stem cells are part of the problem, we could circumvent the problem. Or we can kind of question the very premise of the problem. If the goal is to provide cardiac function, maybe there's a way to do it that doesn't even involve um, heart muscle, like an artificial heart, for example. And that totally circumvents the problem of dealing with stem cells. Or if I insist on having perfusion that uh, promotes the healthy myocytes or is required for the healthy myocytes, maybe there's another way that provides perfusion that doesn't require angiogenesis. Let's explore that a little bit further. Perfusion is like irrigation. I can deliver nutrients through a number of different methods. So this is where I draw upon my engineering knowledge. I know I can transport fluids and molecules and substances either through diffusion or through active transport. So a diffusion approach would be something like a drug-eluting stent or a patch that I would put on the heart that would deliver the nutrients that those blood vessels, which are missing, would otherwise provide. Or I can think in terms of analogies, other ways in which things are delivered to other things, or fluids are delivered to other things. By generalizing the formulation and the expression of the question, I can now start to think about something like an irrigation system that would be used in agriculture. 
Or I might think about using hypodermic needles or something imaginative like um, nanotubes. So pursuing the idea of the irrigation system is me to an invention, an aha moment, in which I was proposing to weave these hollow fibers, the same kind of fibers you'd use in an oxygenator, into that diseased muscle and deliver both the stem cells and the nutrients and remove the waste through that same irrigation system. So if I do say so myself, it's a rather brilliant solution. And because there are too few hours in the day, I've yet to really reduce it to practice. But I think it makes for a really excellent example of the inventive problem solving, addressing a contradiction that was really unaddressed and that was really the downfall of that entire line of research of stem cell therapy for heart disease. Those previous examples were relatively simple. In real life, inventive problems are more complicated. Here's an example from a student who took the course a couple of semesters ago. You'll see an equal number of good things and bad things, and some neither good nor bad things, those in yellow, and many interconnections. The greater the detail and specificity in your contradiction diagram, the richer and more diverse will be the inventive ideas it produces. So I encourage you to strive to break down your problem into fine detail to achieve the best results and the greatest opportunity for hitting on a really brilliant inventive solution or set of solutions. Okay, now it's your turn. See Blackboard for the assignment of the week, and I will look forward to seeing you in person on Thursday.